Charcuterie boards. So charcuterie boards, they're just a cutting board with a handle. Uh, charcuterie is the French term that refers to prepared meats. Uh, really, you know, it's a grown up Lunchable. And so uh, here, I mean, you can see these pictures here, whether it's meats and cheese, uh, great options, uh, dessert boards, super popular for spreads, for entertaining, uh, all kinds of things, a grazing board. So lots of options for how to use these. They make great gifts. They're very popular, a very high uh, selling item. Uh, but lots of options here when it comes to wood grain. So I'm gonna explore uh, some of the different wood options, uh, some of these species here, uh, talking about how to make these boards, right? That's the whole point of this video. Uh, as far as templates, freehand, other options, uh, wood finish, some tips, tips and tricks. I've made well over 50 boards, uh, lots of tips I picked up along the way. So check it out, how to make a charcuterie board. All right, first up, wood selection. But before I get into that, be sure to use those timestamps down below if you just wanna skip around to a specific step. Uh, if, if a section you don't necessarily need, skip around. But I do wanna talk about wood selection because there's some great pieces here. Uh, I do have a whole resource here, Wood 101, link down below. Uh, different types of wood, how to learn about wood, where to buy the wood, where to find it. Uh, some great options there, so be sure to check out that resource. But I do recommend a hardwood. Uh, walnut is very popular, so any kind of walnut is, is a great buy it's that darker wood. This particular one is Clara Walnut. Any wood that has some figuring, um, some, some really different colors, chatoyance, or however you pronounce that word, right? Uh, the different colors really, really draws in customers, right? And it really stands out for, for a piece. And so you can do that with walnut. It's a little bit pricier. Even a wood like cherry, you can get some sapwood contrast. That's interesting. I take a boring piece of cherry, and we got some interesting pieces here. The thing about sapwood, usually furniture makers, they don't like the sapwood. So you can get it, you know, sapwood, heartwood. It's usually a little bit more affordable at the lumber yards and adds some, some great interest. I really like that with black walnut. This one is pine. Um, I usually recommend just hardwoods, but because you're not really cutting this, as long as it's kept well, um, you know, with wax and whatnot, it should be fine. But there's a lot of figure and interest. Uh, some curly figured maple, we got some sapili mahogany, lots of options. One option, you know, that I got here with all this Clara walnut is I do have some pieces that have the live edge. So if you have a local sawmill, as long as your wood is dry, uh, as long as you're sure that the wood is, is nice and dry, um, that's a great option. This live edge effect is a really cool look. I've done that quite a lot. The one problem with these is usually there's a lot of work to be done. And so shortly, I'll show you some steps how to fill voids, uh, bug holes and tracks like that because that's a necessary step that you get with any woods, but especially if you're finding a local source or maybe you even mill up some of your own. This is a great project if you, you know, end up dropping a tree uh, or you have, you know, this an old, this is a plum tree, just like a small one that, you know, over time filled the voids. It's an interesting little piece. So some really great options here. I do recommend the single species. Uh, you can check and I've, I've done some before with multiple species glued up. It's a good look like a, a, a laminated cutting board, but most of my customers and, and myself, the look of just a solid wood species is great. So lots of options with wood. Again, use those timestamps if necessary. But next up, how to fill voids uh, so you can get a piece workable like this and uh, patch any of those holes. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna make sure if the holes go all the way through uh, that you've uh, marked it off in the bottom. And so I'm just using some tuck tape, some sheathing tape here. Um, you have some other options, but this just works best and it's often used with epoxy. And so uh, I like to use two to one uh, epoxy. I use total boat, two to one epoxy uh, with a slow hardener. Uh, it works best for me. A lot of other great products out there, but this is just one that I've used. And uh, you know, follow the directions on, on the bottles and go ahead and mix it up. You can add pigments uh, and kind of mess around with the different colors. Um, I usually like to do multiple epoxy pieces at the same time uh, when I mix it up, but you can do some black pigment here. Uh, when in doubt, just go clear. Um, you know, sometimes the color really can mess it up, so uh, you don't need to get too cute with it uh, because again, the star of the show is the wood grain, uh, and so you don't wanna lose that. But you just gotta keep applying it. Dental syringes really help uh, sometimes on those tight places. Uh, depends on, on what kind of void you're filling. Uh, but it can take quite some time as it seeps in lower and lower. 
Afterwards, you want to use a heat gun. Uh, you could use a blowtorch just to pop those air bubbles uh, as it seeps in and settles uh, over time. But pretty straightforward, uh, less than a day, uh, but give it some time to fully cure. All right, as far as the pieces itself, you know, cut it to the shape and size you want. If you're planning to ship them, kind of account for that. Obviously, you gotta think about your template. We'll get to templates very shortly. But here I am just taking some of these bigger slabs and cutting them down. Uh, I'm using a drum sander here just to smooth, that, smooth them out before template work, uh, just so I have a flat surface. Uh, you could use a planer for this. Uh, just be careful with figured woods uh, so you don't have too much chip out. But you do wanna make it nice and flat. You could also just use an orbital sander. Sometimes you're gonna have to come back with some CA glue and just do some more little voids. Talk a little bit more about this later. All right, time to talk templates. Uh, so to get the look you want, right, you want a design. Now you could definitely just take your wood, freehand it, and then just use a jigsaw or a bandsaw, cut it to shape, good to go. I've done that, it totally works. But if you have a style you really like and you wanna re reproduce that, uh, making a template or purchasing a template is a great option. All of these templates I just hand drew, just messed around with different shapes. You know, some a, a wonky looking one here, different handle styles. There's so many online. Fortunately, since I started these a couple years ago, a lot of others have made templates. So you can buy pre-made templates uh, out of MDF. Uh, usually they're out of MDF or plexiglass. Uh, you can find them on Etsy. There's some other options. I'll try and leave a link to some options down below of where you can find these templates. Where you get the template, you just attach it to your wood, uh, kind of trace it out and rough cut it, and then use a flush trim bit. Works really well, uh, works great. Uh, attaching it to the wood, some people use double stick tape. I just feel like it's a little bit stronger to use uh, CA glue, super glue and activator. And then you can see there's little bits of uh, the blue tape on here. Sometimes I forgot to add the blue tape. Uh, so after a while, it, it kind of got a little, a little messy, but you can see right here, it just kind of matches that template. So here are my steps, how to uh, attach the templates, how to carve it out with the flush trim bit. Check it out. So once you pick your template, go ahead and just trace it out. Here you can see I used the chalk line. And then I'm just drilling out the inside hole and I'm just gonna do a rough cut with the jigsaw. Uh, of course, you could just cut it all freehand. So here you can see you can make quick work uh, of some stock. Uh, but if you want a really refined look, do a rough cut and then we're gonna follow with that, that template. So here I'm using the blue tape. This just helps with cleanup later, saves me some sanding. Uh, I'm going a little overkill here, but uh, it just works for me. Uh, cleaning it up, and then I'm adding CA glue. So super glue and then accelerator, um, using Starbond here, and then just hold it in place just a couple seconds and it's, it's rock solid. Then clean it up with a utility knife just so you don't have uh, the tape uh, gumming up your, your bit and then a flush trim router bit. So this, this bit is amazing, it cuts like butter. Uh, link to this bit and, and all the stuff down below. Uh, but at a router table, you can really clean it up in no time. And this just makes things go really, really quickly and just get that uniform, repeatable look. And here you can see it just pops off pretty easily. Uh, that blue tape makes it nice and clean and nice and clean with that. Here's some other ones that I've done in the past where you can see they've all been done with that, that router template, uh, the same handle style. So it can definitely be done this way. Okay, yes, this is a CNC. Uh, I know a lot of those uh, woodworkers, we love traditional woodworking tools, which I do as well, uh, but I've recently got a CNC, so I wanted to try out uh, as far as efficiency, and oh my gosh, yes, absolutely. A CNC can cut out so many more unique profiles. Uh, so many more things. If you're curious and wanna learn a little bit more about it, I have a couple other videos on it. It really is a, a pretty intuitive tool and I do have some content on that to, to help with the CNC work. But after you've done those void fills, after you've done all the work, gonna do some sanding. These live edge pieces, they usually have, they take a lot more love, uh, right? So oftentimes they have more of those bug tracks uh, because you have some, some bark inclusions and other work. So you might have to do some more CA glue, uh, that you know super glue just to fill those voids, the accelerator, and just keep, keep working at it. So that is a, a step in the process. Uh, lots of sander options. Uh, the live edge boards having a bench top unit, obviously I should have clamped it here as you see it skating around the, the workbench, is really helpful for just cleaning up the edges, maintaining that live edge. 
Uh, I've already filled these boards with epoxy. However, after surfacing, you can see I have some punky wood here. So punky wood, it's really soft, and that's just not gonna fly for, for a board. It's just gonna absorb everything. So the same steps as before, but instead I'm using a penetrating epoxy. Um, with this, obviously you wouldn't do this with a cutting board, but once the epoxy is fully cured, it is food safe. And so this is just gonna ensure longevity on the board. Uh, but here you can see some other pieces. Some got some more penetrating, some got some of that CA glue. But throughout the process, you'll find some voids that will pop up. CA glue is the quickest fix, uh, but sometimes epoxy is necessary. Then you're gonna sand it down, get it nice and clean. Uh, once you have your boards nice and clean, really important uh, just to get that final profile just so. And so uh, one step to get that final profile is that bench top sander again. This, this particular one is an oscillating belt sander and spindle sander, which is really helpful. It's certainly not necessary to have this, but especially with the handles and some of those, uh, you know, inside, you know, whatnot, it's helpful to have. Uh, you wanna have that refined final shape before you do any router work uh, for your edge profiles. And so having a spindle sander works great. There are attachments for drill presses or drills. I'll leave a link to those below as well. But then adding a round over just really classes up your board and it just makes it feel so great in the hand. Uh, whether it's a subtle, you know, small round over or a thicker round over, just kind of play around with what size works for you. Uh, but this really does uh, take the board to a new level. Uh, having a router table like this is super helpful. This is just a homemade one. I do plan on making a video soon, just kind of showing some options with router tables. But here you can see the board. So they've been, you know, kind of rough sanded to 80 grit, uh, profiles are done, and they're already looking beautiful. Um, for sanding, I usually like to do 80 grit with a random orbital, and then I'll do 120 hand sand, 120 random orbital, hand sand 150, and then 150 with the random orbital. Um, you do have to do hand sanding. It doesn't matter how many special tools you have, you always wanna do some hand sanding uh, just for that shape. But after all of the sanding up to 150 grit, I like to raise the grain. Now this is really a necessary step for anything that's gonna come in contact with food or a piece that might get washed. Uh, when the wood fibers get wet, the grain uh, is raised. It gets rough to the touch. So by getting all of these boards wet, uh, the wood fibers raise up, and then after it dries, right, I want it to dry slowly. Don't, don't speed up this process or your board will warp. Uh, so just a little wet. After they dry, uh, then I can go back and sand the boards to take care of those wood fibers that have been uh, raised. And it's just gonna make a smoother board uh, for the end user, for, for the, the customer or the recipient of the gift. Um, so make sure you do raise the grain with just a little water and uh, then come back and sand. So now I'm hand sanding at 220 grit and then uh, I'll use the random orbital at 220 grit. So now it's really smooth and it's ready to go. It's ready for finish. All right, let's talk wood finish. So this is a board that's gonna come in contact with food. And so really you do want a food safe finish. Technically all finishes, if they're fully cured, are food safe, but I do recommend using something here, right? One of these options here. Uh, the go-to for most woodworkers when it comes to cutting boards is mineral oil, right? We get a bigger, bigger container. Uh, soak it with mineral oil and then finish up with a wood wax. Uh, whether you make your own or, or you use this, this product by Walrus Oil, great, great product. That's what most woodworkers do. Uh, there is a walrus oil makes a cutting board oil that has mineral oil and other waxes built in and then you finish with the wax. Uh, one other option, right, is tongue oil. So pure tongue oil, uh, mix it with a citrus solvent. Uh, walrus oil now actually has their own solvent, food grade. These are all food grade materials uh, where you can mix it, deeper penetration. There's a lot more involved in this. I, I did this on one of my cutting boards uh, projects. It's just a lot more steps to get that full penetration. Furniture oil, right? Furniture butter. Tried and true, this is, let's see, what is it? It's linseed oil and beeswax. Lots of coats, lots of coats, but this is a good option as well. Howard's, there's other butcher block conditioners. For this video, I'm gonna show you just dunking them. I, I've done all of these, I've done some other ones as well. My go-to really is mineral oil. So I like to just do a really good soak of mineral oil, let it dry out, and then follow up with wood wax. And so here are, are my steps on how to do it. You can skip around if you need to, but wood finish. Here we go. 
So with a big batch like this, it really is helpful to have one of these big plastic totes. I can just go ahead and pour the mineral oil over it and uh, just slowly get all the boards in there. You just wanna make sure that you saturate all of the wood. Um, as far as how much oil to do, some people love to soak a board overnight and just you know go to town. Really for me, I've found that it just needs a quick soak, a good soak. Uh, it doesn't need too much because mineral oil doesn't really dry. It doesn't evaporate. So whatever you put there, it's going to dry a little bit. You know, I put these out and then overnight they're going to dry a bit the next day. Uh, but it's going to be oily for a week or two weeks to come. Uh, so you don't need to go overboard uh, because you're going to follow it with the wax. Now what I like to do after they're mostly dry, I wipe them off and then I sand them at 320 grit. So even though I've already raised the grain, it's like a bonus raising of the grain with the oil. This is just gonna make it that much smoother. So you can use 320 grit and then lightly with the sandpaper and the random orbital, just very lightly. Or you could use like a light scouring pad that works as well. Then you wanna apply your wax. Uh, so just a, a light coat of the wax. Uh, sometimes you might have to do a second coat of the wax uh, if, if you have the luxury of waiting to see you know, how, how much it absorbs, but you just want to apply the wax everywhere. This really provides that great uh, waterproofing uh, finish and it gives a great luster to it. Uh, after it's sat for you know, 10, 15 minutes or so, you just want to wipe off the majority. You can just buff it with one of these you know, blue shop towels or other units. I like to use one of these random orbital buffers. Uh, it works really well, gets it nice and a nice sheen to, to the piece and get it, gets it where you want it to go. Uh, sometimes you will look at it and like, you know what, you'll decide you need to do a second coat. Uh, I have done that in the past, uh, but I always include uh, some wood wax uh, with, with my boards for the recipient so they can maintain the board as well. But there you go. This is a beautiful batch, some just gorgeous colors. That's all nature right there. That's all those natural colors, the wood grain. So that wood selection really is key. Uh, make a great choice. Here's some other boards I've done through the years. Uh, just some really, really fun pieces, some unique shapes and just great colors. Well, there you have it, how to make a charcuterie board. Uh, if this video was helpful, if it provided value, please consider subscribing to, to see more videos like this. This is usually what I'm making, uh, small projects like this, hardwoods for a hobbyist, right? Pretty approachable. Uh, links to all those videos I mentioned down below, the tools, all that jazz. You can also check my website or Instagram to see some other styles that I've made through the years. But have fun with some sawdust, some sawdust shenanigans, and I will catch you next time. Take care.